I was born in Glendale, California. And this is all for the record, because I know that you probably couldn't, you didn't, I don't expect you to know that, but now it's recorded. So you'll know where your dad was born. You may want to look it up someday. What the fuck was going on in Glendale? So I have no memories of Glendale. I was the youngest of four. Um, I was the only boy. I had uh, two half sisters, same mom, different father, and one full sister. Um, my father did not marry my mother. So um, there's that. And, you know, I have pictures of me in Glendale as a little baby, but I don't remember that. Of course, my memories start at 104th Street. The address was 3726 and a half West 104th Street in Inglewood, California. Now, in this day and age, people that hear that right away are like, whoa, that's like a terrible area, you know, and, and it is. It, it was, and it's a bad place. I mean, you know, if you look like me, it's not a lot of fun. Um, imagine yourself being a piece of salt in a pepper shaker. People notice. So, um, and then uh, this used to be very bright red hair. So, the, you know, it's bad enough being white in a black neighborhood, but when you got red hair and you're white, you might as well just beat your own ass every, the minute you wake up. Just to fucking... <laughs> you just wake up. Yeah. Yeah. You mm -hmm. just get yourself wedgies and shit. But, mm -hmm. uh, but so yeah, I, my first memories are living there. Um, and, and so it was in that, this is in the seventies now. Um, and in the 70s, at this time, the Vietnam War was in full effect. And of course, it was the big thing, you know, I mean, it was like, that's all that was talked about. You know, every channel on TV was giving, you know, lists scroll by every night of, of, of how many Americans died and their names and shit, and where they were from. So every American was was glued into the Vietnam War and one either they were had somebody over there fighting or they were protesting against it because it was a big influx of the hippie movement. And so there was a ton of anti-war riots and protests, you know, and this is what happened in, uh, um, uh, what the fuck was that university? Um, Ohio, the Ohio state university at the, or was it Ken state where the national guard shot a bunch of people. So it, it was a super rough time to be alive for, for people older than me. I was young and I was aware of what was going on because, because, my mom was a full on, you know, heavy into that. She was like a, a full hippie, you know. I mean, they did things that were called rap sessions. That was really popular. And I had never heard that term since I grew up. I've never met anybody that even remembers that. But that was huge. Uh, rap sessions were when hippies and a hippie was somebody that hated, you know, hated the government, hated cops, hated the war. And, uh, you know, a lot of bikers and shit. And they would go to one house or the other, and they drag all their kids along. That's weird. This is just for observation purposes. As I talk about rap sessions, I got a massive pain in my stomach and my heart. So these things, this is how life affects you. It's very strange. It's an interesting thing. I just point that out because, you know, Brent, you and I love to be, we're observers of life. And the human mind is crazy. But I'm, I automatically am drawing up in memories of going to these, and I got tears welling up, and I and my stomach hurts really bad right now. And I'm fucking 62 years old. And, you know, we're talking, you know, five years old. And, and so it's just amazing how you carry shit with you, dude. It's uh, unbelievable. So rap sessions were basically in that time... You get you go to somebody's house and they all you know if they had kids they drug them and they had little kids little babies teenage kids you name it and in the front rooms of these houses all the people the adults would sit around and they smoking a lot of marijuana which was a felony back then I mean if you had one pot seed you'd go to fucking jail it was a serious crime but they're blazing the fucking dope and whatever else they're doing but. They would keep the, like my sister Sandy, my mom would include her. And that's what fucked her up. You know, she was they, she treated her like an adult, which we, she wasn't. Sandy went on to commit suicide. So not not because of this, but um, in my case, I was shoved into a back bedroom where there's all these like blankets on the floor. And there's 20, 25 kids that you don't know, you've never seen and never will see again, more than likely. And there's babies crying and literally older kids fucking right in front of us and, you know, five, six, seven year olds. And we're like, whoa, you know, we, we're not sure what we're seeing, but there's this shit going on all around. 
So, you know, and it's an all night thing that goes on till, you know, when, when suddenly somebody shakes you awake and you're starving to death and the sun's blazing and now you're in the back of a fucking, you know, a car that's probably stolen and you're fucking end up back home somehow. So that was, that was that. And, you know, at the time my mom was, she got really into the whole anti-war thing and she, you know, I, I was physically hit by my mom on more than a few occasions for, for pretending I was a soldier, you know, and she would grab me and, you know, my mom was very violent and, and her thing was, you know, don't you ever, I don't ever want to see or played with my friend's toy soldiers she, because, you know, she couldn't stand the military. They were baby killers and, and they were over there destroying other people's country and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the only thing she hated more than soldiers was cops and she fucking hated them. They were called pigs and she could not stand them. And when I was a little kid, I, uh, my mom used to tell me it was, it's funny looking back on it. Cause I heard it all the time. Jesus fucking Christ. You stand just like a cop. She said, used to say that to me all the fucking time. I, and I'm talking, you know, five, six, seven years old. She said I had the stance of a cop. And of course I take that as a compliment. Um, but you know, so then she started getting into, uh, you know, my mom was a loose woman. Let me put it that way. And I'm sorry, mom. I'm just being honest. I mean, she was, if you wanted to get laid, you wanted to come to our house. And it didn't matter who the fuck you were. You, know, you just didn't matter. Um, she liked the fucking, the totem poles. So, you know, and the drugs and the alcohol and everything else. She was just a party, party chick, man. And so she ended up having a lot of hell's angels at the house, <clears throat> which is terrifying when you're, when you're a kid, that's scary as fuck. Um, I mean, I was, I was put on the back of some of these Harley Davidson's man and given, you know, it felt like a hundred miles an hour. And I'm like thinking I'm dead. You know, you know some stinky fucking dudes that, you could just, I could still smell the guy. So these guys would come in the house. Now think about it. You got a, a, a lady who my mom was pretty hot, let's be honest, back in those days. And she's got fucking three girls and a boy and no husband. What do you think was going on with my sisters? Now, my oldest sister, Cindy, she didn't last long because she was constantly running away. And she ended up, she ended up going into the foster care system because she was the oldest and her and my mom it was just a battle. My mom was very violent with the girls. And so I'm getting to why, what made me realize I wanted to be a cop. And so in the front room on 104th at 37, uh, 26 and a half, it was super common to get up in the middle of the night to take a piss. And, you know, I had a little blanket I called a wanky. I couldn't live without it. And I carrying it over my shoulder, come out of the bedroom. And there's a guy that I'm terrified. You got to, the, the important thing is the fear I had of these guys because they were huge, loud, long hair and they fought when they were drunk and they, you know, it was just brutal. But, you know, I'd be walking by and there's a goddamn Harley Davidson in the front room with the fucking engine taken apart. And, hey, little fucker, hand me that monkey wrench. I mean, you know, and you do it, you, you're terrified of these guys. They're like monsters. So I, I never was not afraid of these guys. They were big, loud and punching and hitting and, you know, it was brutal. So, and, you know, we always had bikes in front of the house, motorcycles and shit. So one night and uh, that was going on. The house was full of these guys all day long because my mom would barbecue and do all this other shit. Why me and the, my sisters are starving to fucking death. No bullshit. My sister, Shelly, the middle one used to sneak. We talk about that. She's still alive. Sneak around and she'd fucking take a piece of chicken off the barbecue. She had a whole route she could go through to get around and come back and then we'd hide and eat it each of us take a bite and it was risking your life because my mom would beat the fuck, out, the fuck out of her for doing that but you know one day i'm i'm in the fucking living room and there's like there's like five of these bikers in the house and a bunch of other people too like women uh, and the fucking whole front door just flew off the fucking hinges like a fucking nuclear bomb Ba-boosh! it just blasted off you know, and I, it's, it scared everybody, you know, but I was just looking, I happened to be looking right there too, right when that happened. And these fucking Inglewood cops come storming in. And I was very young at the time. And I was, I didn't know who these guys were, but they were yelling, grabbing, hit a guy, sit down, shut the fuck up. You know, after they had him on their, their head, in those days, they searched him on the wall, hands on the wall, you know, search him down. Hey, what do we do? Shut the fuck up. Nobody asked you anything. 
and these what what I'm sitting here looking at this and the thing that stuck with me right I mean I'll never forget it but so much was in coming at me the biggest thing was that these monsters that I was terrified of were absolutely terrified of these fucking dudes in blue which really affected me I was just I've gotten weak as I've gotten older guys I, don't, I didn't used to always cry like this that happens, by the way. It happened to my dad. But um, but I was shocked at that. It was impossible. That's like seeing it's like seeing your the scariest person you've ever seen. Somebody say, sit down and shut up, and they do it. You're like, what? Wait, what? And now I start looking at these dudes, and I'm like, everything was now in the in the 70s, nothing was neat. Everybody's hair was long. If you were black, you had an afro. If you were white, you had hair down to your ass. It, everything was sloppy, belt bottoms, tie-dye clothes, fucking stickers on the cars, you know, peace, you know, make love, not war. Everything was fucked up. My house was a disaster, just a big pigsty. Nothing was neat, except these motherfuckers. They come in, man, and I'm, I'm looking at these guys. They're fucking shit lined up, perfect, all of them. They just lined up. Shit, shirts look good fucking badges they had these belts with these fucking guns and ammo and i'm just and it squeaked when they walked and they all had a set of keys in the fucking buckle and i'm like and their hair was the same it was short which you didn't see many people with short hair in those days and i just remember thinking to myself watching this one of those guys was wanted for something serious that's what happened and they knew they found out that he was in my house so that's how and then they ended up taking like two or two more away from warrants standard police shit but this one dude was a bad dude, like seriously bad, bad enough to go take somebody's door off when they got an informant saying, hey, he's in that house. So, I mean, I can tell you that the handprints on those walls were there for months, months. And I'd come out and look at that and I'd stare at those fucking handprints. And I, it was such an impression on me, man. Um, but I, very clearly in my little kid head, I heard this in whatever terminology I used at the time. It meant this. I don't know who these fucking people are or where they come from, but I am going to be one of them. That's that's the life I need to be living with. Who are these? These are like angels, dude, but they're tough. And in those days, cops were all like six foot tall. You know, they didn't hire people. They had, to, they had a height limit. You had to be like five, nine at least, you know. So everybody was big and fucking, you know, and they're nice to me, you know. Hey, you all right, little man? You know, I'm like, I just wanted to go with them, man. I just wanted them to just, I just wanted to go where they were going. So I never forgot about that. And that that was the most profound moment of my life in terms of what was going to set me off into the direction that I ended up going. Um, and so years go by. We, we went from, you know, I could tell many horror stories of my Sandy being molested and, and shit that happened to us and, you know, we, we lost many homes. Every house that we ever rented, we ended up getting kicked out, evicted. And so we ended up in a motel. Now, anybody that knows anything knows that motels are the last step before homelessness. You know, when you when you when you live in a motel, the next step is the street. That's how that progression works. 